the specifics of this chapter from a very broad perspective toward a more narrow perspective. Now I'm going to use our model of aggregate supply and aggregate demand and try to get us to the meaning of the Keynesian multiplier so we can use that for fiscal policy uh, applications going forward. So here we have a picture of an economy using our aggregate supply and aggregate demand framework. How's this economy looking? Not so good. You probably have a hard time reading it, but I have the words recessionary gap down here. We can see aggregate demand is down. Let's say for a minute, because I'm going to change this because I have to because the numbers don't add up. Let's say the economy aggregate demand has fallen by a trillion dollars. And the policymakers we have hired to, to serve us uh, are two kinds, fiscal and monetary. But we're interested now in what the fiscal policymakers might do. Fiscal policymakers are politicians, right? So we're talking about those two tools, government spending or taxes. So let's say they want to close this gap with government spending. And that's, you know, remember, the determinants of aggregate demand are CIG and NX, the national income identity. They could increase G to close this gap. The sort of good news is they don't have to close the gap. I'm sorry, they don't have to increase G by the full amount of the gap because of this thing that we're working toward called the multiplier effect. Okay, So when the government increases G, increases government expenditure, they hire people to do stuff. A lot of the talk is increasing infrastructure. You'll probably get an infrastructure bill, uh, I would say, no matter what, in the next couple years, and that'll be a major expenditure. We'll see. Who knows? Um, so let's say they're going to do that, sort of like they did in the Great Depression. We're going we're gonna to hire people, and we're going to get stuff built at the same time. Some of the stuff they built in the Depression was like the Hoover Dam and some pretty neat, useful things. And some of it was also hiring people to move a pile of dirt one day, bring them back to work the next day to move the same pile of dirt back to where it was the day before. Whatever it is, we're not worried about what it is. We're worried about what the money does and what it does to the economy right now. What they're doing is putting disposable income in people's pockets. Y sub D is what I use for disposable income. Disposable income is equal to your income after taxes. It's the money in our pockets. Okay, in our current uh, situation, we were we households were actually were given uh, effectively a tax refund um, if we filed taxes in the past two years. I think it was three hundred dollars per adult and five hundred dollars per dependent child or something like that. Uh, that the idea there was to put money in people's pockets. Now, when we get more money in our pockets, we have a choice. Uh, and for our purposes, we're only looking into this in these broad sweeps so that we're going to make the choice between you have to choose to do a balance of two things with new money. You may either spend the new money or not spend the new money. We call that saving. So Y sub D is equal to consumption plus saving. C plus S. Okay? Now, if the government puts money in our pockets by whatever means, this new disposable income, let's think about what that means for the economy as a whole. If I have more money in my pocket, I'm going to buy some stuff, right? And if I buy some stuff, what does that do to somebody else? That puts money in that person's pocket. And now, the thing is, how much stuff I buy is this balance between consumption and saving. So let's say that I'm a very typical American consumer, and we're all going to be typical American consumers for this. And let's say that of the new dollar, I save 80%, I'm sorry, I spend 80% and I save 20%. So this would be 0 0.8 plus 0 0.2 equals 1, right? If I do that, what, and I'm the typical consumer, then what that means is every time we put new money out there across these consumers across the country, what we're saying is of a new dollar, they're going to spend 80 cents of each new dollar right on down the line. One consumer, next consumer, next consumer, next consumer. That relationship is, is called the marginal propensity to consume of a new dollar. That's the margin. The propensity is from the word from the English language, just this tendency to consume. So we're saying that 
give me dollars and I'm going to act like everybody else. We're all kind of the same or what you're really doing is averaging across people and we're going to spend 80 cents of a new dollar. So our marginal propensity to consume is 0.8 um, and what this to represent this in symbols because I know you have to to make sense of the book what we're saying here is that this is the change that's a triangle for delta in consumption over a change in disposable income. That's all we're saying. You get a new dollar, how much of it do you consume? I'm going to suggest at first that we consume across us 80 cents of a new dollar. How much then must we not be consuming? 20 cents, right? Because we have to either consume or spend. So of the new dollar, the change in savings over the change in disposable income would equal 20 cents. So one thing that you might take away from this is that because we define income as either having to be spent or consumed, uh, spent or not spent, spent or saved, that is, then it must be that our marginal propensity to consume plus our marginal propensity to save will always equal one. I, I hope that's just, just really uh, enlightening because in the book it's more complicated, but that's why it's so. Okay, well, that now is going to be useful for us to start to, ex to, to get to that answer of if this is down a trillion dollars, how much does the government have to spend to get back? I'm going to hit pause on the recording right now and come back with that.